round of applause, please. For that beautiful introduction, Davinia, thank you. Uh, it is wonderful to start this uh, town hall, Women of Macquarie. There's around about a bit over 100 of you who have joined us. Um, so thank you very much for, uh, it might even be more, I'm being told. So we're up to 145. So, and we know there are still more likely to join us over the next hour. So thank you very much. Um, and it's wonderful for Tanya Plibersek and I to be here. Can I start by acknowledging the land that we are on? We're in Parliament House and it's the land of the Nambri and Ngunnawal. And I want to pay respects to Elders past and present of the land that we're on, but also for the women of Macquarie who are on Darug and Gundungara land. Uh, thank you very much for being part of tonight. And Davinia, thank you for setting the scene for a, a, a very female event, I have to say. Uh, we, we thought we'd like to create a really safe place to have conversations amongst women. And given, given COVID, we always knew bringing you together in a single physical place was going to be next to impossible, let alone when I've got all of the Hawkesbury and all of the mountains. And it's a cold winter's night. So thank you for... Uh, being part of a Zoom. Uh, and I really want to encourage you to do a couple of things, to keep your video on. We found that it does add to that sense that we are all together to have your video on it. And if you're on a computer or laptop, obviously you can set your screen to gallery view so that you can get a sense of the incredible women we've got. And by the way, I've, I've had a bit of a look through um, the many names, just to give you a picture of the women who have joined us. It's the mountains. So, of course, there's teachers and academics. We've got authors and artists and performers. We've got Rotarians. We've got lots of small business women. We've got women who are affected by the floods. Uh, we have the community sector very well represented. We've got church representatives, LGBTQI plus representatives. Uh, and look, I think women from all walks of life, young, old, and everything in between. So thank you for that. And as you click through, you'll probably see names that you recognise. We also want to encourage you to, to chat. There is a chat function. If you use that to ask questions or make comments, and we really welcome you to introduce yourself, as I can see wonderful people are on the chat already, and, and let people know where you're from. Everyone is muted, but admin will unmute you if we call on you for during the Q&A because I am hoping that I can, we, that Tanya and I get to see you, your faces and hear your voices as you ask questions, make comments and make a contribution. We've obviously only got an hour, so we know it won't be possible for everybody, but we will um, try and get as many, as many of you having, uh, being part of that conversation, both by typing and by speaking. And if you've got any technical issues, could you private message please our tech support person who's sitting there making sure it all goes smoothly. Um, so that's some of the housekeeping done. Uh, but this is really for me as your federal member, a moment to bring the women of Macquarie together. Uh, the, I, I think we, what we really wanna do is try and connect the things that we've been experiencing here as parliamentarians and bringing together that confluence of events, the amazing speech that Grace Tame made in January when she was made Australian of the Year, the um, terrible experience that Brittany Higgins has had, uh, which really rocked the foundations of this particular parliamentary building. The work of um, uh, Chanel Contos and the whole issue of consent um, and, and then, of course, the events of Christian Porter, which gave it a different uh, level of intensity, I suppose. So all those things seem to have happened, and I just wanted us to get together and think about how that connects with what we experience in our own lives as well as across the electorate. Um, and it is an absolute privilege, Tanya, to have been able to get you here. There, we have no more votes coming up tonight but you might hear the bell because the Senate's still sitting and, and at eight o'clock, you will likely hear the House of Representatives bell to say that it's risen. But Tanya and I, we're here and not 
not being drawn away, but thank you for being here. Oh, it's such a pleasure, Susan. It's really um, very kind of you to ask me to, to speak with your constituents. And um, we're combining two of my favourite things, which is talking to great women and um, campaigning with Susan Templeman, who is just such a brilliant, uh, well, you all know that she's a brilliant local member because you see how hard she works in the electorate. Um, I, of course, get to see her um, in Parliament and see that not only is she an extraordinary local member continually raising the issues that are important to her constituents, but she's just such a huge contributor to the broader debates that we have here in Parliament. Her professional experience, her background in running her own small business um, just makes her such a, a valuable contributor to uh, our policy development down here uh, in Canberra. And um, I don't know, I, I basically do whatever <laughs> Susan asks me to. So <laughs> it's nice to see you all. That was really good. Thank you, Thank you Tanya. Uh, We have some wonderful uh, guests who we're going to help lead the discussion that we do. And we're going to cover a few issues. But we're going to start with the hard one in a lot of ways, which is violence against women and the myriad of things that have occurred. And to help us with that discussion, um, uh, shortly I'm going to bring in um, Cherry and, and Ailey from the Blue Mountains Women's Health and Resource Centre and Maria from the Women's Cottage in Richmond, who are uh, very kindly going to help, help the discussion. But I guess, Tanya, we should start by really just framing how you're feeling uh, when, I mean, it's been an extraordinary six months uh, and I've never seen anything like it, in, you know, in all the years that I've been connected to politics. What, where do you think we are now, given all the things that have happened? Um, well, I, I think there's, um, there's uh, pluses and minuses in what's been happening in recent months. And uh, the, the, you know, if I started with the negative, um, I'd say it's been phenomenally traumatic for women of our generation, Susan, mm -hmm. to think you know, we've been working so hard for so many decades to um, leave the country safer for, for our daughters and our granddaughters. And, I, you know, I, I perhaps had fooled myself that we'd made a bit more progress than, than we have. I think um, what has been, what we've been reminded of with Grace Tame and Chanel Contos and Saxon Mullen and, and Brittany Higgins and the Christian Porter, uh, um, thing and and I have to say, with the the re-election of Barnaby Joyce oh. as the deputy leader of the National Party, is that in fact we haven't made as much progress um, as we had hoped. I think for for a lot of women, it's been um, a, a very traumatic few months, uh, particularly people who have been victims of sexual violence um, uh, or, or domestic violence or, or sexual uh, harassment. The fact that these issues are being constantly canvassed can be really re-traumatising for a lot of people. Uh, there have been a lot of disclosures um, that, that, for example, journalists have been receiving disclosures from all sorts of people and, and that's been very hard for them. On the upside, I would say um, we're now having the national conversation that we should have had 20 or 30 years ago. We do have the report, um, Respect at Work report from Kate Jenkins. We have a Prime Minister who um, has realised that the women of Australia are going to um, march outside Parliament House, are going to march in our capital cities, are going to hold his government to account uh, if there isn't more action. And so um, for, all the, for all the difficulty, um, heartache uh, and, and trauma of this last few months, I, I do think we have a moment where we can really combine to press for real change. And I, I hope that we do see some real change. And we, we do have, someone's actually mentioned Andrew Lamming mm -hmm. and Alan Taj. And we have- Another great example. Yeah, yeah, we have literally just come from the chamber having for, I think the 10th time, moved a motion uh, or tried to move motion to have uh, Andrew Lamming suspended for removed from the committee that he chairs, which he said he'd stepped down from, but he clearly likes the money and hasn't. And we've had women every every day that we've been here, and the speaker just said he thinks it's the 10th time we've done it. Um, the government's completely non-responsive, but we're 
These are things we, we haven't been letting up on. And the respect of work report, I think we're going to get well, to I mean, it was a year. The Sex Discrimination Commissioner um, gave the government the report well over a year ago, and it and it took really this public outrage with the government's uh, lack of response to issues around violence against women for the government to finally say, yes, we're going to act on the 55 recommendations of respect at work. Um, they said that they had accepted every recommendation, but of course they haven't. When you read the response from the government is very clear that they're not prepared, for example, to legislate for a positive duty on employers to actually provide a workplace that's free of sexual harassment. They base, the government basically claimed that that already exists. Well, that's actually, frankly, bullshit. We're allowed to say that at 7.30 at night, I think, in a private meeting like there this. There are some mums um, and their daughters, yes. but um, uh, hopefully right, well, they'll forgive us. I'll, I'll mind my language from now on. Um, but it, it is... Uh, um, I think it's important for us to, to keep saying that every workplace needs to be a safe workplace and, uh, and to use uh, this moment in Australian history, which I, I think can, can actually be a bit like um, the, the Me Too um, movement, which as you know, people who follow this in the US would know, Me Too was a slogan before it became a, a hashtag. It was a movement before it became a hashtag, but it, you know, a few events happening at the same time can really push something into mainstream public consciousness and and allow um, allow us to get things done that we have wanted to get done for the longest time because because the attention exists and the moment exists. Uh, Isabel's commented that Barnaby Joyce's. Um, uh, you know, revival uh, was perfect timing for this town hall because it just highlights the thinking of those opposite. Um, as did a debate today where four uh, coalition men spent uh, the best part of half an hour giving speeches, telling um, a bunch of women from regional and peri-urban communities that we didn't know our electorates, that we didn't know what we were talking about and basically being arrogant and patronising which I called out in my speech. So, it, yeah, well, it really and, and sums Susan, up what they Susan, like. just today, I mean, like 2021, there was a debate in the coalition party room about whether childcare should be subsidised and one of the nationals called, called uh, early childhood education and care outsourcing parenting. And the, the, the nerve of someone who spends... 25 weeks a year in Canberra talking about outsourcing parenting blows me away. But it, it honestly, there are people in this place who, um, who <laughs> it's like they're living in the 1950s, honestly. Yeah, and as Susie Van Optop says, yes, they're living in a different century. Now I'm going to bring in Cherry and Ailey and Maria um, and just to ask the, the three of you really for your thoughts in terms of what your, so how is that translating in the things that you're seeing coming through the doors of your incredible centres? You've, you've got two centres that have different but um, incredibly important roles with, with supporting women. And Maria, I don't know, maybe I might start with you because you are really looking at helping uh, women who are trying to escape domestic violence, who have experienced violence in some way. Well, can you share with us what you've been seeing in, in, I know it's got changed since COVID, but where you're at now would be great. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> whenever I start this conversation, Susan, I feel like I have to go back to the, the bushfires in 2019. <clears throat> Excuse me, because that's the point where we at the Women's Cottage saw a huge mushroom of women coming in, of the number of women coming in, of the reports of violence, but also the severity of domestic violence. And then in the Hawkesbury since then, we've had the floods, we've had COVID, and we've had these next lot of um, devastating floods. And so each of those events has seen more women coming in um, around domestic violence. 
more severity of violence, but I guess maybe on a positive side, more women coming in for the first time saying, I'm not sure if this is domestic violence, but so more women, or I guess, are a little bit more open to explore what's happening for them or just um, ask for help with trying to work out that disease that they've been feeling about what's been happening. Um, so it hasn't just been um, a flood issue or a COVID issue, but it's gone right back. And I, I would say that our numbers have more than doubled since the fires. Um, yeah. And have your resources and your funding been doubled to match it? Not our, um, we, actually, we actually have got some COVID money for domestic violence casework. I guess my concern is that goes for a year. So that ends in December. Um, and like I said, all of those issues that started before COVID, they're not going to be resolved. And all of the shortfalls that were there before COVID are not going to be resolved. So come December this year, I'm going to be really scrambling to try and... Um, you know, continue to do that work. And I'm sure that um, Sherry and Ailey would um, agree casework, so workers who can work alongside women in an ongoing one on one way over a period of time to help them navigate that journey. It's a huge, there, there's just not enough of it anywhere. And the I guess where the money has gone, in my point of view, um, when you look at safer pathways um, and things like that, that's been money, well, two things. One, that helps, in theory, get women to services. But if the services aren't there in the first place, then, you know, there's a mismatch there. Um, but also it only... Um, supports women who have already put their hand up and have gone through the court system or have already approached police. So that in itself is a major issue too because um, we know those who get to the police, they're just the tip of the iceberg basically of everyone else who needs help. Mm. Um, um, shall, we, shall we get to see how, whether this is similar to what you guys in the, on the Blue Mountain side are seeing? Are you Anything that parallels? Yes, thank you, Susan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having us. Yeah, we agree with what Maria said the, in the increase in the demand on services. And certainly um, from our intake worker, we know that the, uh, that the um, recent uh, you know, speaking out by Grace Tain, Brittany Higgins, Saffron Mullins and others has um, brought a, a new wave of demand on people seeking support. From the service um, and we know that in our service essentially women are coming because they are seeking support around family and domestic violence or sexual assault that's 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 the um that's what women are seeking from the center but we we've also seen like uh, an increase in women approaching the center around things around taking action and public action around um violence against women gender-based violence um and recently the um enough is enough rally that we had in the blue mountains was led and initiated by community um community members who came to the center um you know to talk about what we could do as a community and we're seeing more and more of that so um so on a, on a number of spheres, taking action like the rally, taking uh, ongoing things that we can be doing in our community and a whole lot of appetite for community grassroots level mm -hmm. action. Ailey leads on our um, EV project, the Ending Violence, Improving Equality project. Can you tell us, tell us a bit about that? Absolutely. So I work on the EV project and... Basically, it's a primary prevention project that is kind of an umbrella term across a lot of things we're doing at the centre and a lot of resources that we're producing out of the centre. And it's all kind of based off our watches primary prevention model. So what that kind of looks like on a day to day basis is I have a, I predominantly am working with young people, really engaged, um, really passionate young activists 
Um, so we run like an Instagram where we talk about like consent laws and things like that. Um, they also co-consult on a bunch of resources we're producing for young people around things like coercive control. Um, they were also, plenty of them were actually at the rally volunteering, um, networking with their community and that kind of thing. But something that is kind of sad about it is that this is a really vital program and we just feel like we're getting started. But in fact, in technically eight days, the funding for this project runs out. Um, we've been really lucky to the centre has decided to take it on for another few months out of the centre's budget. But things like this, especially when you're talking about primary prevention, you need a long term outlook. You need proper community consultation and input um, everywhere. And these young people need to get connected with their community and be part of the conversation. Can I just interrupt there? I, I noticed in today's newspapers that White Ribbon, um, you know, there were all those changes at White Ribbon uh, a while ago, but one of the big changes they've made is to um, start a grants program for primary prevention projects. Um, I, I know it probably won't fund everything you're after, you know, but I, I think they've got grants for up to $5,000 for local projects. It'd be maybe worth having a look. We'll, yeah. I'll dig that out and make sure we send the link through. Um, Absolutely. Thanks. When I hear this sort of stuff, Tanya, it nearly kills me that we're not in government to be able to act on it. And in fact, I'm going to ask Tess, who's an academic from Lura, um, and now we don't know how this is going to work, but hopefully, Tess, we can unmute you. And I'd really invite you to make the comment that you've, you've messaged to us. Is this going to work, Ariane? <laughs> Yes, yes, it'll work. There we go. We've got Tess. Here I am. Tess, uh, you can Look, I don't know. I don't. I don't know what more I can say, Susan. I keep raising this in ALP forums, and I'm told that you know the leadership is out of our hands, and one one appointee comes from the left and one from the right, and these are two great candidates. I no issue with either of them. It's just that. Seriously, women are crying out for power, for representation, for control. And the best the ALP can do is put up two men. And, well, and I, I believe we will election. lose the election on this basis alone. And look, I, I understand why it's easy to look at it that way too. But as Tanya says, our executive is four people and we've got 50% representation because what happens in the Senate is just as important as what happens in the house. We've got two incredible women there. Christina Keneally, you know, who yep. has been a trailblazer, as has Penny Wong. Amazing uh, women. I, I yeah. absolutely concur. And, but they're and in I the look at, And I look at the front and I get the, uh, I do sense from women, especially of, I want to say, our generation, which is a wide, a wide age range. Um, but at the front bench, I look at the front bench and I'm just, blown away by, well, we have great, great women on the front bench, fantastic women on the back bench as well. Uh, and I guess you've been around to see the shift. So when, I, when I started, when I was first elected, our um, female representation uh, at the federal level was 26% female and we're at 48% now. We're, 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 we're ahead of our target. Um, we, we were due to get, our target was 45% by 2022, and we're at 48%. And if we'd won the last election, we would have met our 50% target, um, you know, years, years early. Um, and uh, Susan's talking about the, you know, the front bench, but we've got amazing people like Susan in the parliament who, who keep winning really difficult to win seats. Uh, and... I understand um, why people are frustrated by the, par the performance of the parliament when it comes to gender equality. But we have, you know, in 1994, we set ourselves our first target of 35% of winnable seats. We met and beat that. We raised it to 40%. We raised it to 50%. And each time we've met and beat it. Does that mean that the Labor Party is not a sexist organisation. Well, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, we still have lots of culture change to do. Um, we need to make sure that 
we're not just focusing, you know, we're not just choosing uh, hardworking, fantastic female candidates for marginal seats, but that we have representation right across the board from the most senior positions to the most grassroots positions, that we have equal representation throughout the organisation. And that probably more importantly, that we are a welcoming culture uh, that, that doesn't alienate women with the, you know, revolting, high-conflict, um, personalised sort of attacks that people associate with politics, but that we focus on the issues that matter and that we achieve real change for half the population. Um, we're not talking about women's issues as, you know, minority fringe issues, but, you know, the reason we want more women in parliament is not just because we want more women in parliament, it's because we want to change the world to make the country a better place for women and men. Yeah, and so, yes, look, thank you. I wanted you to be able to give voice to that. I certainly feel frustration looking at the other side. What you don't see in question time, they put a couple of women in the little bit behind the dispatch box. So you think that there's women there, but the rest of it is just this sea of blokes in suits uh, when I look across there. Now, I just want to pull out a comment that Rosemary from the women, uh, Penrith Women's Health Centre has um, messaged through. And this one, I, I've been really concerned about. Penrith has 88 referrals a week from New South Wales Police for women living in the Nepean area. We're due to lose federal money on June the 30th and cut our caseworkers by half. Caseworkers carry 20 cases a week. Like our colleagues, the rhetoric is not substantiated. All services in Penrith are full. Accommodation is impossible to find. Ties into a comment I saw um, Susie had made about the lack of a of emergency and affordable housing and especially medium to long-term housing. These are, you know, these are chronic issues that, that we're facing. Just, Tanya, in terms of the way forward, it is hard to feel, it is that sense of hope. And I think in the mountains, what the Enough is Enough rally was incredible. And in at Women's Cottage does an annual Reclaim the Night March which it always coincides with Parliament sitting these days. So for the last five years, I've been stuck in Parliament while that's been on. Uh, they, they do give you a sense of empowerment and hope, but how, I mean, that's our challenge, isn't it, as a, as a bunch of women to really push this forward so the hope is real? Well, I, I, think, um, I think there's a couple of things. Uh, <laughs> None, no, nothing changes unless laws change, unless funding changes, and um, all the rhetoric in the world, like getting having a government that says we're on your side, we're, we're going to do something about this, unless they're prepared to actually change laws and put money into services, um, it, it makes no difference. And if you look at the most recent budget, the Government was trying to um, portray it as a budget that would meet women's needs. And it essentially what they did after getting rid of the women's budget statement in 2014, when Tony Abbott, the then Minister for Women, decided it wasn't important to um, pull out what was, um, you know, women's programs and what was being spent on women's programs. Um, since then, there's been no accountability on spending uh, at, and at how it relates to achieving aims of gender equality. They, they had a political problem with women this year. They decided to re reinstate the women's budget statement and um, introduce a, a few new women ministers' portfolios. But when you look at what is actually happening on the ground, last year... Um, the Respectful Relationships funding for schools, they spent less than half of the money that was set aside, of the pathetic amount of money that was set aside. And then when we asked about it, they said it, it, there wasn't the demand for Respectful Relationships programs in schools. You look at um, uh, this story of, uh, you know, every, every women's service I've spoken to um, from Launceston to Rockhampton, literally um, from Launceston to Rockhampton and at all points in between, have told me that they are overwhelmed. Uh, regional communities in particular have seen the needs go through the roof uh, for emergency accommodation and other services 
um, COVID-19 has exacerbated the need right across the country, but it seems to be even worse in regional communities because as people have moved out of capital cities, um, accommodation has become so much harder to get. It's so much harder to leave home safely when there's nowhere to go. You all know this story, right? Mm. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But um, you, you can't, like, you know, rhetoric, a new Prime Minister for Women, as Scott Morrison called Maurice Payne when making these announcements, doesn't change anything when funding's running out. and. Um, there's no money being spent on building new emergency accommodation or more affordable housing. There's no real measures around housing affordability. We've still got the economic inequality that exacerbates the threat of violence and the risk of violence. We've got a gender pay gap. We know that during COVID-19, more women lost their jobs, more women lost hours. Women were less likely to get government support, despite the fact that they were more likely to have lost their job and lost hours. They got less of the government funding that was available for support. We know that older single women are the fastest growing group of people moving into homelessness. Um, is, you, you, cannot, you cannot say you support gender equality and care about these issues and then not actually fund what needs to be funded and change the laws that need to be changed. Today, I noticed that family violence legal, uh, family violence prevention legal services have been excluded from the discussions on the next um, national plan. I, I read somewhere. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> the epitome of frustration there. Um, now, um, I'm really conscious that I've got uh, Andrea Turner Boys from Women with Altitude in the wings here, because, and I well. I know we are not going to be able to have as, as deep a discussion. There's incredible, wonderful contributions coming up about, no, we don't need more milkshake videos, do we? And yeah, a real emphasis on the housing crisis. Uh, and I know as shadow, as a minister, you were minister for housing and the last substantive things that I've seen in our community to address affordable housing and housing for vulnerable people was when Labor was in government. And there were that in the Enritas program, there were there were great programs. And they don't solve it all instantly, but getting it started, if it had continued, we might not be where we are. But I'm really conscious that Andrea is there. And I want to think about women, women and that whole juggling thing that women do that clearly the blokes in the coalition party room don't think they need to do because they can outsource childcare to wives. Um, and really just talking about the challenges. Andrea, there are, we've got a really big women's business community, haven't we, of self-employed women, uh, women who just decided the only way they can really um, juggle the demands they have is to run their own business. Certainly what I did when, when I had this child, I went, right, no way I'm going to be able to be a journalist, married to a journalist, living in the mountains. So I've got to uh, earn an income, but have no control. I'm just wondering what you're hearing from the many different women that, that are in your network. And I know there are other, a lot of small business women on, on this Zoom. So um, I'm going to look well, out. Well, one thing is they're tired. <laughs> Thank, you <for laughs> tired. <laughs> Thank you for we having me. Thank you We should have had a poll, Andrea. I love this had conversation. A poll. Yeah, they're tired. But look, it's really it's really interesting because we we have we look at big business and we look at the things that we know that are just everything's driven for profit. Where we work or where I work is so many women just getting out there and giving it a go, but also because they've had to, or they just they they want to have a better work life balance, or they you know they've come out of relationships, um, and you know they're giving it a go, and it's hard. It's really hard because. You know, we have a lot of, you talked about before, um, you know, the homelessness. I know so many women who are running little businesses that, you know, that's just hand to mouth. They don't have any super. Um, they've come out of long-term relationships and lost a lot of their super or whatever might have happened. And I feel that it all kind of links in. I mean, I'm always trying to be hopeful because I want to link more of the communities together. Um, because I think when we do that, then we can help each other more. And, you know, I think it was Kathleen, someone wrote before, we, don't, we need to stop funding, we need to have 
investment. It's like it needs to be long-term investment. But sometimes when I'm bringing, you know, the business community together, what my hope is that, um, you know, there's a lot of husband and wife businesses that have been very successful and long-term, but there are people really wanting to make, um, you know, change and give back to community. So if we can keep linking the community sector and some of the, the, the challenges with you know, we might be able to get more funding and investment or some action from a different source, you know, rather than going to our government that seems to be on deaf ears, but yeah. And Andrea, I've done a terrible job of properly introducing you, but That's okay. unfortunately, <laughs> the Women's Collective has filled in the gap. So Andrea oh, has on the chat. Thank you. mentoring Thank you. organisation called Women with Altitude, which I joined, I don't know, a yes. decade, more than a decade ago, whenever... Yes, yes, you did. And so, um, and so that's the other thing. Like you've always you've always been a member even before you were like running for office and things like that because you could see the importance of people coming together. And that's like at the end of the day, you know, if you think about our male counterparts, they would they nailed this, you know, friggin' centuries ago because they knew how to network and look after their boys' club and you know, in a way that we women didn't have the ability to do, but we are now more and more. And, um, you know, we've got to do that because we've got to help each other. Yeah. And, and, and the structures are not necessarily there and you've created a structure and there are other groups that do similar things. Um, I know Sarah Cassam in the Hawkesbury, there's a whole yeah. lot of women just going, we need to come together. One of the issues that always struck me, one of the reasons why I went into business to do the juggle was because of the cost of uh, having the, the cost of having someone else educate my children in those early years. Yep. And, and of course, back then, given my daughter's 30, we called it childcare. But of mm -hmm. course, we know that it is absolutely formative years of early education. I'm wondering if we can just go, there was a comment from Rosemary. Um, I'm not sure, by the way, while while Ariane's looking for Rosemary to just share her her import um rosemary bishop it is there's now i think 168 people on this zoom so welcome to the people who've joined us in the last little while um i just feel I just want to i just want to rosemary, rosemary just mentioned hey we women have always been great networkers and you're right rosemary we are and we have been but i just don't think that we've had the volumes um that you know required sometimes I, I think as women we've just had so many other things to juggle it's just yeah. not been something that we've been able to tap into have we got rosemary just to talk about um her thoughts yeah. on early childhood education on um, actually that wasn't my, my early childhood education was because i wasn't using the chat well i copied someone else's comments and, <laughs> oh. and, and, but i well, could talk about that but not now <laughs> <laughs> But you know, about the networking, I think that actually links in very much to the way we've actually networked to, to, to be able to cope in a dominant culture that was, um, you know, much more patriarchal. Than Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so I think we're great networkers and that's, um, that's mm -hmm. why we've done so well. Mm. Yeah, it's a really good point. And as it's that... The formal channels of power, and I think Susie is just mentioning the, yeah, the structures that are yeah. there. I yeah. mean, it does feel like the um, the way the Labor Party works is very different, clearly, to how the women work opposite. And I remember my husband said to me a while ago, oh, well, it's that Labor's got these good, strong women. And I, my response was, you shouldn't have to be strong. It shouldn't be about strength. It just You should be able to be whoever you are as a woman within these structures. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the bit where I think we've got work to do so that we're accepted for whatever. We shouldn't just be the strong women. You can be strong in a lot of different ways, but you can be soft and gentle and have absolutely as much to contribute. I think really what happens in organisations is you, you this idea of critical, um, critical mass is actually, I, I really believe it. I think culture change when you've got a critical mass of women allows, um, a, a, it, it means that um, the, the early women who had to compromise and sacrifice and kind of hide parts of their personality yeah. to mm. make it through a hostile organisation, you don't have to do that anymore. You can actually be 
a, 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 you know, the whole range of different types of human being that there is to be um, once, you, once you get to critical mass. Mm. Well, the, the whole issue of early education, I mean, the way we've got to, the point we've got to is that it should be universally available and essentially free, almost free, so that people aren't, women aren't missing out. Um, but I know there's women who still tell me they have to, they'll restrict their work to a few days simply because they go backwards financially. I'm also seeing some older women here and I'm wondering if there are grandparents, grandmothers who are picking up. Yeah, there we go. Tess has put a hand, popped a hand up there and I can't see everybody, but it feels to me like older women, the grandparents are really carrying a big load and maybe not what they expected to be doing as a grandparent, not just the fun stuff, but the hard stuff too. And one of the reasons that um, someone mentioned in the chat earlier is uh, it, it's hard to afford childcare. We, we obviously want to make child, early childhood education and care much more affordable for, you know, the majority, you know, vast majority of families. But um, housing costs are just so difficult these days that it's very hard for anybody to, um, for, well, for young people to save a deposit to buy a home of their own, that's becoming harder than ever. But rents, uh, depending on where you live, um, in a lot of uh, outer urban and regional communities have massively shot up. Um, the cost of housing is going up. Uh, it, it's very difficult. And you add to that, at the moment, um, the government has increase the cost of a university degree for thousands of students so that a, a four year, say a three year Bachelor of Arts with an honours year will now cost you $58,000. So people are leaving uni mm -hmm. with almost $60,000 worth of debt, you, ch un unaffordable childcare, high housing costs, wages have been flat for eight years now, wages have been flatlining. So and work is less secure, it's less predictable and it's less secure. So you put all of these pressures together for young people in particular in those, um, in those early years when they're forming, forming a family, forming relationships, putting down roots. It's really hard work. I'm just reading some incredible comments here and thank you for your contributions. But things like um, Karen saying, you know, changing the narrative about childcare being good for women well <coughs> excuse me it's good for everybody it's early education and it just is transformative and the small amount of that we invest compared to others i also have to give a shout out to kay remington who was the one who did the first comment on early learning oh, there you go. <clears throat> proper attribution isn't that good? that's right a good journal always and i'm not also noticing michelle brown you're picking up from your customers that arabesque in Springwood that there's a lot of older women who spend a lot of their time doing grandparent duties. Um, I don't know whether you've got any any example you can give of how you've worked that out. And if we can find Michelle. I'm just going to have a good cough here. Yes, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to step in here for a moment and pray that Susan hasn't no, got no. COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I've had my first AstraZeneca a week before it changed. <laughs> I, I fit in that up to sixty age group, and yeah, yeah, me too. I've been on the issue, and I don't know if you want my five cents worth. Yes, go for it, because I think it's yes. interesting that you know that from your customers. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, I um, I hear it all the time. Um, a lot of my customers are grandparents or grandmothers, and they will. I I mean, I have I hear all sorts of things, but they generally um, talk about how busy they are and how they some of the, some of them are a little resentful, to be honest, um, about the amount of work you know they are doing, looking after kids. That a lot of them are really really tired, and I feel them. <laughs> As a mother, I think, wow, that's hard work. Um, but it's really common. A really large percent um, see it as a job. Like they lo obviously love it, but that, that they have a commitment, certain hours, certain days. And, um, and some of them will come into the shop with the kids and then say, oh, gosh, I'll come back. It's too hard. And, you know, it's, it's like parenting, I suppose. 
it's really, yeah. really common. And, and I know I relied on my mum a lot when my kids were little and uh, especially living in the mountains but my clients being in Sydney and I know I'd drop them off at mum's uh, and head into work. And I guess it's that that balance it does feel like it's gone a long way the other way I think they um, feel obliged to help them out financially because yeah. they know they're struggling yeah and we really we really hope that by making um, early education m so much more affordable that it becomes not not something you know they get to do the fun stuff hopefully as grandparents and yeah. Robin Cook is getting some shout outs here because she's mentioning looking after aging parents as well and as I experience that, and I can see from my, the people around me, there can be a lot of time spent away from work. Um, now, I'd like to, uh, again, we've probably so much more we could talk about a whole session all on its own, but I'd like to bring Davinia in as our wonderful performer, Davinia Ether, because she's had, she's a young woman who has is just starting out in her music career and I had to do that during COVID. And I just thought, Davinia, it'd be really great to get your insight into the other women um, and musicians that, that you you hang out with. And I know you, you get lots of gigs, but how hard has it life been for a young woman, especially a young musician, over this last little while, and, and especially with all the stuff that has happened in the last six months? Yeah, well, I can only speak for myself and, as you said, the people that I know around me. Um, and I am very fortunate that mu music is not my only stream of income as well. I have another job. Um, so I was very fortunate through this time, but I know so many people who, um, you know, had to try and find work when all of the all of the gigs got, in, in two days, all the weddings got cancelled all of um, any kind of celebrations, all of the concerts and launches people had organized, um, all the competitions, you know, all, all people's income, it just completely disappeared um, in a night, which I think um, definitely along with everyone else in the country, but especially with artists um, where music or, um, you know, the performing or whatever they create is their outlet, their emotional outlet. I think it's been really hard for a lot of people to suddenly not be able to share that with the world in a way that they're really used to. Um, so that's been really hard to watch a lot of people go through as well. Um, you know, on, on the positive side, um, there was a lot of time suddenly to be able to create and to be able to write and um, diversify and you know I learned the guitar and picked up um you know my my technology that I've been using tonight with the looping that's all things that I didn't really have time for before um and a lot of people have used the time to write and re record and release their albums which is really great but still um it's 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 been a really interesting experience to try and move into a new industry that's already really difficult to get into um, when, and understandably venues are trying to be loyal to the people that they've supported for, for many years. Yeah. And, and Davinia, even at the best of times, yours is a hard industry to, yeah. <laughs> to survive in. Yeah. Um, and, but, which is why we were, we're thrilled to be able to have you here to, to share your talents. Um, I feel though young people, I know everybody's lives have or every woman's life has been affected by COVID in, in one way or another. And there's lots of women on this call who might now in June be expecting to be overseas, traveling as part of a retirement or semi-retirement plan. Um, there's all sorts of things that people would have been doing, but I do really feel for young people and in the context tonight, you know, young women and their hopes and dreams. Yeah. Uh, I, feel, I feel you're doing it tougher than me in a lot of ways. Um, so. So thank you for keeping on smiling. And apparently I am, oh, we've got, yeah, we've still got questions. Um, so there are questions. There was an Anne Fitzgerald question. I don't know, can I take Anne's question? It was way back at the beginning for you, Tanya. Are you there, Anne, to ask that question you, you shot through right at the beginning? Hello, I'm actually in Tasmania, but I'm a Macquarie woman. 
<laughs> well, um, thanks for joining I, us for that. Thank you. The rumours we're hearing are that it is likely that the election will be called for October the 9th. What are your feelings on that? Uh, I think it's um, I think it's very possible. I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there is an o October election. And um, I, I can I hope you don't mind me saying we've got four minutes to go before the end of the Zoom. Uh, if you want a, a government that is responsive to the needs of women, um, you need to elect a Labor government. And to elect a Labor government, we absolutely need to re-elect Susan Templeman. Uh, she's um, she's such a huge contributor, such a hard worker. It's such a marginal seat. If you can help, please make sure you do help. Um, the October uh, election date, I think, actually is made more likely by um, the bringing back of Barnaby Joyce. Uh, I think he is an accident waiting to happen. He has a, a history of um, causing chaos uh, in um you know, every role that he's had. Uh, I, it's obvious that Scott Morrison in more recent times have, has realised that his absolute refusal to act on clean energy um, and climate change is a problem for him. He's been trying to inch towards that zero net emissions target by 2050. If Barnaby Joyce is coming back to blow that up, that... Um, that says to me that Scott Morrison will be looking for an election sooner rather than later to try and contain how long that damage runs for. So um, I wouldn't, I mean, some people have said an election as early as August. I, I don't think that's right, but uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if it's October. Which is very, and, but I'm very grateful to Christy uh, and I'm, I'll be doing some, as much follow up as I can, because there's so many great ideas that Christy is talking about young people and the mental health crisis in the Hawkesbury, which is actually across the whole electorate. Uh, great work being done by individuals, but so much more to do. Well, and another great example of Susan's work because she got the first headspace in her electorate yeah. and has been campaigning for the second one. Yeah, yeah fingers crossed. Um, now, can I thank all of you for being part of this? I don't know about you, but it's just gone so fast. Yes. And I'm sorry, I can't, can't, there's incredible comments and I haven't been able to um, get you to, to say them. Um, I, I'm hopeful at some point before too long, we'll be able to get Tanya out in the electorate. But, you know, at whatever way we can, I want to keep this conversation going. Um, and I'll certainly be doing that. What we're going to do is take you out with, um, with Davinia. So I'd really encourage you to hang on the few minutes and, and listen to Davinia uh, one more time, especially if you missed her at the start. Um, can I just thank you? And thank you, Tanya. Oh, it's a pleasure. Can you see the incredible women that I have in my community? I'm sure there's other, every MP says that, but I know mine are really special. And we will just keep communicating. Please let me know the things that will matter. I think I'm also going to send through um, any extra questions and maybe some to, to get your input on some of the issues we've talked about. Uh, if you have anything to suggestions around um, affordable housing, you know, different ways of doing it, I'm really keen to hear that. We've got constraints where we are, not much land in the mountains, um, land that floods in the Hawkesbury, and, and obviously everything in bushfire zones. So any ideas you have around that, I'd be really keen to think about local solutions for us. So thank you. And Davinia, can you take us out? And could we perhaps give Davinia a round of applause? She might not be able to hear it. And I will hopefully talk to many of you soon and hopefully face to face. Thanks, Tanya. Mm -hmm. Over to you, Davinia.
Keep you